Building secure applications is more important than ever. Users trust apps with the most sensitive information, and they expect that this data is safe and secure. But at the same time, the threats are evolving, and developers need to work hard to fend off attackers. This is a new series called Better Safe Than Sorry, where we'll dive into how to best protect your app from malicious actors. We'll deep dive into how different forms of authentication are more or less secure, and what you as the app developer can do to use them as securely as possible. In this series, we'll also talk about how to write and to test your security roles, and we'll explore how AppCheck can make sure that only users on your genuine app are able to talk to your backend. Our goal is to demystify authentication and security. And to do that, we'll talk to the people who built the platforms and tools that keep Firebase safe and secure. Here we go. Throughout the series, we'll be working with this app to explain the concepts we're talking about. It is a to-do app built on Firebase. It uses Cloud Firestore to store tasks, and each user has their own collection of tasks. It also uses Cloud Storage to store images associated with tasks like a receipt I need to pay back to my friend. And we use Cloud Functions for some backend processing. Finally, we're using Firebase Authentication to let our users sign in. Our application supports multiple client apps, Android, iOS, and web, all running on our users' devices. Our client apps are able to talk directly to the backend. This is what we call a serverless architecture, and it gives us a number of major benefits. For example, there are no servers that an application developer needs to manage. Google is doing all of this for us. Also, and this is really cool, our clients can receive real-time updates from the backends. This is what makes the apps feel so snappy. This architecture might be surprising if you're used to a server-based architecture, where the server acts as a natural security gateway and is the only component of your app that can talk to the storage layer. So, Given that Firebase apps let clients talk directly to the database, how can a Firebase app make sure that only users can see their own data? Well, first of all, we need to know who the user is and what they're allowed to do. You may have heard the terms authentication and authorization, and it's easy to mix them up. So knowing who the user is, that's authentication. And knowing what they're allowed to do, that's what we call authorization. In Firebase, access to every backend service is protected by one of the following two mechanisms. The first one is security rules, and the second one is what we call a trusted environment. Security rules let you decide who gets to access data in Cloud Storage and Cloud Firestore. A trusted environment is a runtime environment that you or a service provider like Google controls. For example, because Cloud Functions run on Google infrastructure, they're a trusted environment. On the other hand, because you don't control the user's device, client applications are not considered a trusted environment. Trusted environments can use the Firebase Admin SDK, which gives them full access to all the information in your database. For example, if you write a Cloud Function, you can access the user's details, such as their user ID and other information that you control, and use this to decide what they should be allowed to do. So because Cloud Functions are considered trusted and have full access, it is your responsibility to code defensively when using the admin SDK inside of Cloud Functions. We'll talk about this in more detail in a future video. So when a client sends a request to the database, for example, to fetch some data, this request goes through security rules. Security rules are a configuration file that you, the application developer, write to let Firebase know if a request should go through or be blocked. For example, to decide if a user should be able to read a specific document, you can look at the request to see details about that user. Each request contains an auth object that's populated by Firebase authentication and contains information about the user. If the user has authenticated, it will contain a Firebase ID token. For example, here is a user request to see all of their to-dos. The security rules see that this person is only trying to fetch her own data, so that request is allowed. 
In this example, a user tries to read data that doesn't belong to her, and security rules will reject that request. Preventing access like this is authorization in action. So let's recap what we've learned about our app so far. To access their data, users have to go through a two-step process, authentication and authorization. Authentication is verifying who someone is, and authorization is checking what they're allowed to do. For Firestore, Cloud Storage, and Real-Time Database, you can use security rules to handle authorization. For trusted environments like Cloud Functions or your own server, you can handle authorization by implementing custom logic based on the user's information. Let's dive into authentication. What does authentication mean? Ah, I believe it's from the Latin authenticus, meaning original, genuine, or uh, authentic. That's right, Scholar Todd. Authentication of users contains two steps, identification and a verification process. First, the user needs to identify themselves. This is often done by providing a unique identifier like an email address. Second, the user needs to prove that they are who they claim to be. It could be to provide a secret that only the user would know, like a password or a security question, or it could be that they have access to a device or a key that is registered to that user. So let's look at a couple of examples. The most common authentication mechanism is email and password. And as you all know, it's hard to make this form of authentication as secure as possible. For one, it requires users to pick strong passwords, which they don't always do. Also, malicious actors can try to get hold of passwords by phishing them from the user or by trying to get their hands on insecure databases. Here's another example. I'm a fan of signing in via magic links, also known as email and a sign-in link. When a user signs up, you can send them an email that contains a link, and that has a short-lived one-time use authentication code. The link takes the user to a login page where the auth code is exchanged for a normal long-lived auth token, just like someone that signed in with email and password. This mechanism gets rid of passwords altogether, so it's an improvement over users and developers juggling passwords. And this process automatically verifies your email address. Phone number authentication works nearly the same way. Instead of sending a magic link to an email address, the authentication code will be sent to the user's phone via SMS. In native apps, it's possible to use silent notifications to receive those authentication codes, which means the user doesn't even have to switch to their messaging app to retrieve the code. And the last one we want to touch on is social login, also known as federated identity providers or OAuth2 providers. Instead of creating a separate login for each app, users sign in to an identity provider, such as sign in with Apple or Google sign in. When a user wants to log in, the application sends the user to the login page of the identity provider, and the user logs in there. Then they're redirected back to the application along with a provider token that says, yes, this is a valid user and they have successfully signed in and then the app will log them in. The federated identity providers use a common standard called OpenID Connect, or OIDC for short, which is based on OAuth2, which is an industry standard for authentication. Firebase authentication supports all these forms of auth, email and password, email and link, phone number auth, and lots of OAuth2 providers like Google, Facebook, Apple, and GitHub. And if you already have your own authentication system, you can use custom authentication to integrate your own system with Firebase. To learn more about this, check out the documentation at this URL. The last piece of authentication we want to cover in this quick intro is that in addition to the SDKs, Firebase also maintains libraries to handle a lot of the tricky parts of authentication, like password recovery and email verification. We've also linked to those libraries in the description. They're the easiest way to make sure that you're handling these complicated flows correctly. OK, so now that we know how authentication works, let's talk about authorization. As a reminder, authentication is who someone is, while authorization is about what they're allowed to do. Ah, authorization is derived from the Latin auctor and means to give authority or legal power to. Thanks, Todd. Cool. So after a user has successfully signed in, their ID token is sent along with every single request they make to one of Firebase's services, such as Cloud Functions, Firestore, Real-Time Database, or Cloud Storage. 
This is handled automatically by the respective client SDK, which sends the token as a bearer token. Bearer token means give access to the bearer of this token. Usually, those kinds of tokens are sent in the authorization header of a HTTP request. Now, if you worry that a malicious actor might intercept the token, rest assured that firstly, all Firebase SDKs use HTTPS or other forms of secure communication with the backend. And secondly, that the ID token is cryptographically signed, so it will be invalid if it's been tampered with. But that's not all that's required. All requests also need to make it through security rules. Let's take a look at some basic security rules. These are taken from our sample to-do app. For all documents in the to-dos collection, the first rule means that anyone who's signed in can create a new document as long as the user ID attribute on that document is the same as their user ID. In other words, they can only create to-dos for themselves. The next line says that when reading or modifying a document, the user ID field on the document must equal the user ID attribute on the request. That means users can only read, modify, or delete their own tasks. Cool. So security rules are pretty flexible, but also very powerful. And that's why we will spend the entire next episode on security rules to talk about this in much more detail. Good authentication and authorization is an important defense against malicious actors trying to impersonate your legitimate users. But that's not the only attack vector to watch out for. Other approaches an attacker might take are hitting your backends to see if they can get access to any unprotected information, or running up your bill by hitting your backends. To defend against these kinds of attacks, we've launched a new product called AppTech. AppTech is an additional layer of security that protects access to your services by attesting that incoming traffic is coming from your genuine application. It will block any traffic that doesn't have valid credentials. This is one more tool to keep your users and their data safe and secure. We will talk about this in more detail in a future video. That was a lot to take in. Let's recap everything we've learned. Firebase authentication lets you identify your users and provide them with a personalized experience in your app. Firebase authentication and security rules together allow you to implement authorization for your app and make sure users can only access the data that you want them to. And finally, AppCheck protects your app from malicious actors having any access to your backends. In the upcoming episodes, we will dive deeper into the individual topics, such as security rules, onboarding and UX, using the auth emulator, and of course, all the authentication providers that Firebase supports. If you have any questions, leave us a comment below or reach out to us on Twitter. Thanks for watching. And we will see you in the next one.